community members in certain ways. And the equal distribution might allow us to do that. Okay, so this, uh, Rawls' argument, according to Nielsen, for the one on the right, goes too quickly. Okay, now here's a worry, right? So the grayed out parts are the parts of the dialogue we've already seen. So skip down to the, the first um, one with the black text. So here's a worry. Uh, you might say that Nielsen is not correct, strictly speaking, when he says that Rawls is only concerned with money here. Right? He's concerned with primary social goods. That is, there are things that every rational person is presumed to want, whatever a person's rational plan of life. And these include not just money, but rights and liberties, powers and opportunities, and income and wealth, and the social basis of self-respect. Okay, so Nielsen has thought about this, and he says that doesn't actually help Rawls making that point. Self-respect is, for Rawls, the most important primary good, and it is something which is to be shared equally. In situations of moderate scarcity, we cannot, in Rawls' system, trade off a lesser self-respect for more of the other primary goods. Right? Hopefully you all remember that from the Rawls read. But the disparities in power, authority, and autonomy that obtain, even in welfare state capitalism, and are not only allowed, but justified by the difference principle, undermine, for the worst off, and indeed for many others as well, their self-respect. Okay, so this is another way of putting what we earlier called the key idea. Okay, so again, Nielsen points out that even if we, you know, point out that it's not just money, but all primary social goods that Rawls thinks should be distributed according to the difference principle, uh, Allowing for the inequalities that Rawls allows for allows for differences in autonomy, which affect what we should, or what it's rational, how much self-respect is rational for each person to have. Okay. Now, the debate does not end there. Okay. Uh, here's how Nielsen imagines Rawls responding. Okay. And this is based on a lot of stuff that Rawls himself says. So, Nielsen imagines Rawls saying, now look, self-respect need not be undermined or even diminished by the disparities in power and authority allowable in his system by the difference principle. Right? Rawls argues that a well-ordered society in which his difference principle is in operation would not be a society in which these inequalities in power, authority, and the ability to direct their own life would, for the worst off, and the strata which are near relatives to them, be particularly visible. Hence, their self-respect would not be diminished. All right, so the idea is that, well, what is the idea? Right, why does Rawls think this? Well, as Rawls imagines a just society, that is, a society with equal liberty and that also satisfies the difference principle, um, we'd all be parts of multiple overlapping groups where, you know, even if you know, somebody could have had some kind of authority over you, say, at work, you might be ahead of them in terms of your, some group, uh, a team that you're a part of, right? If you're on the same soccer team, you might be the captain of the soccer team, whereas your boss is, is not. So there's kind of, uh, the idea, Rawls' hope anyway, is that these differences in authority, these hierarchies that would develop in accordance with the, the, difference, princ the difference principles allowed inequalities, they wouldn't be a big deal because they wouldn't structure all aspects of our life or something like that. Okay, so that's kind of how Nielsen imagines Rawls responding to the previous point. Now, according to Nielsen, this is, quote, a tendentious sociological description of life in contemporary class societies. It is, in particular, very innocent about the nature of work in those societies. Such a view of things could hardly withstand reflection on the facts about work in the 20th century. All right. So what Nielsen is saying here is that Rawls is just kind of uh, vastly overestimating, or let me put it this way, Rawls is vastly underestimating the importances that differences in authority have to the rational basis for one's self-respect. So in a way, he's just going through the stuff we talked about earlier about how uh, 
you know, when, when your boss has, or the cops have, or the landlord, your landlord has, like, these abilities to exercise authority over you, that, you know, tends to, it, it, it at least makes you vulnerable in a way that you wouldn't otherwise be to their abuse and exploitation. Uh, and that, yeah, so we've, we've kind of talked about that. All right. Now, work through this again on your own if my explanation hasn't been helpful. And make sure... <laughs> Uh, make sure that you understand the proposal here before moving on, because it's important. All right, so Nielsen continues. He says, Rawls's view still reflects an incredible elitism and paternalism. People are to be kept in ignorance and are to moderate their own aspirations and to accept their station and its duties with respect to roles, roles which often will not bear comparing if self-respect is to be retained. Okay? Rawls's realism here has driven him into what, in effect, though I'm not, sh I'm sure not an intention, is a crass apology for the bourgeois order. Okay, so uh, Nielsen's suggestion here is that this point from Rawls uh, is kind of nothing but uh, an over-optimistic defense of how things are now instead of kind of uh, a full-throated elaboration of how things should be, even if that challenges how things are. Okay, so again, what's Rawls going to say here? Well, he's going to say, look, you might be right that those, uh, those inequalities and those hierarchies kind of do threaten people's self-respect, but again, it's the best we can do, given that it would be irrational to demand more equality in primary goods than the difference principle allows. I right? think back to that important graph. Now, here's Nielsen's big point. I think all the debate between the two of them up until here is kind of is nice and interesting, but this is where the rubber meets the road right here. Nielsen says, some would say, and there are conflicting elements in Rawls's theory which would support them, better a greater equality and self-respect than more goods. Right? The idea is that it can still be rational to choose this distribution on the left, to the distribution on the right, because amount of goods, even in terms of primary social goods, is again, not the only thing that it's rational to care about. Right? It's also rational to care about our relations to other people, and those relations might be better in the equality world than the other one. Right? That's where the rubber makes the root. All the rest of that conversation and dialectic is interesting, but this is the, the big point. Right now, what do you think about that? Right, so might you say, might you agree once you see right bosses and cops and landlords, for example, who, you know, they seem to have a much greater ability to dictate their own lives and the lives of others than you have. Right? So imagine you're choosing between two worlds, right? One like our world where people have these kinds of authority over others, and so they have kind of greater autonomy than other people. But everybody has more primary social goods than they would than they would otherwise. Suppose you can choose between that world and a world where you don't have all of these kind of uh, sources of authority and hierarchy and difference. You have greater equality in all these terms, but everybody has a little bit less stuff. Is it so obviously irrational to choose the more equal world? Again, Nielsen says no. That's not obviously irrational. Or at least not in the way that Walt, that Rawls thought it was. Okay, so here's the key idea, finally fleshed out a little bit more. He says, Rawls' difference principle sanctions inequalities that are harmful to the sense of self-respect of people in the worse-off strata of any capitalist society, actual or realistically possible. They simply, if they are being rational, must accept as justified disparities in power, wealth, and authority which are harmful to them. Indeed, these disparities attack their self-respect through undermining their moral autonomy. In such social conditions, men do not have effective control over their own lives. Right, which by men, of course, Nielsen means people. He says these inequalities kind of threaten our self-respect by threatening our kind of uh, our our autonomy and how much ability each of us has to direct our own lives.
Okay, so that's kind of key idea again, more fleshed out. All right, now it's at this point. This is the this provides the original context for that interesting passage that we discussed earlier, right? The passage that says that a liberty that cannot be exercised is of no value, and if I have a right to vote but I'm never allowed to vote, I certainly do not have much of a right. Okay. So Nielsen's point again is that Rawls is equal liberties are kind of people aren't equally avail. Sorry, people are not equally able to exercise their liberties in a world that contains the inequalities that Rawls allows for. You need a more egalitarian society to actually achieve those equal liberties um, in a meaningful way. Now here's kind of the, the upshot. It says, if the preservation of self-respect is regarded as a conception at the heart of any theory of social justice and is taken as Rawls would take it, to be directly relevant to questions about the just distribution of primary goods, then it seems that we would be forced to adopt more egalitarian principles of just distribution than Rawls adopts. Okay, so that's kind of the upshot of this whole discussion. Right now, he, just for a second, it's worth talking about this. So why, so you might think that Nielsen makes our capacities for self-respect too dependent on other people, right? So. Maybe you think, look, you can have as much self-respect as you want, regardless of how much power you have over your own life via, uh, compared to anybody else. Right? All you need is to kind of just have respect for yourself, no matter what, no matter what your condition is, no matter what anybody else's condition is, nobody can affect how much self-respect you should have. Society, the design of society should have no bearing, you might think, on how much self-respect you have. That's definitely not what Nielsen thinks, right? Or, or rather, you think about it like this. What Nielsen is concerned with is how much self-respect it's rational for someone to have. And according to Nielsen, right, the, what it's, how much self-respect it's rational to have does depend on our kind of social position, right? And how, uh, and how whether we relate to other people as equals or as boss or bossed and so on. Okay, so for Nielsen, 